Okay, there's some introductory music, so bear with me. <laughs> Here we go. The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is the Yaron Brook Show. All right, welcome everybody. I hope you're having a uh, great weekend wherever you are. Uh, I'm excited today. I've got a, uh, I've got I think a fantastic guest with me today, uh, James Tooley, who uh, I'm a great admirer of his work, and uh, we've met I think at least once. Uh, I've seen I've seen James speak uh, at a variety of different places, but. But this, I think, uh, you all, all of you are going to find a real treat. So, so welcome, James. Thanks for Thank joining you. us. Good to be here. And so, you know, I often give talks all over the world on on capitalism and uh, and uh, the the virtues of capitalism. And usually, I get a question about education, and usually, I give my little spiel about the value of private education and privatized education and how awful government schools are and everything. And inevitably, the first question I will get from the audience is, and, and actually, this is the same question I get about every topic, but education, but what about the poor? And luckily for me, um, I always say, go read A Beautiful Tree by James Tooley, because that has the answer. So James, you went and discovered all these private schools and some of the poorest parts of, of, uh, of South Asia and Africa. How did, how did that, how did that happen? Yeah, well, I'm going to, yeah, it, it, it was 20 years ago, I guess it started. Um, now I don't want to give you too long an answer, but 20 years ago it started for me. And I was, I, I, my, my PhD had been about private education and I've become an expert on private education, but everyone knew private education was about the rich, the elite, you know, the upper classes, like you, you were saying. And I felt dissatisfied. So that wasn't what my life should be about for various reasons, not you know, doing stuff for the, uh, the rich, the elite. And I was in doing some consultancy work for the, the private arm of the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation in Hyderabad in South Central India. And on one of my days off, this was doing consultancy about high cost, you know, elite private education. I went down to the Charminar, which is in the center of the old city of Hyderabad, where the, slum, the slums are behind. I went walking into those slums with a hunch about what I might find. And I found a school, a private school, in those days charging about a dollar US per month. Then I found another and another, and I soon was part of a federation of over 500 of these low cost private schools. And, you know, uh, and then it developed. So that was in India. I found the same in Ghana, Nigeria. I found the same in rural China, um, Kenya. And then I started looking in even more difficult places, the South Sudan, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Somalia, and uh, nearer to you, on Honduras. And uh, the same phenomenon is there all over the world. Low cost private schools are serving the poor, low income families. They are the answer to what you, your question that you, you, people raise for you. They are the answer. What about the poor? Well, the poor are, are abandoning government schools, they're abandoning public education en masse. And we can talk about how much en masse it is in a moment, en masse and they're going to these private schools. So it really is what I call a grassroots privatization. Wow. It's and what, what do these schools look like? What would a typical school that you walked into look like? It varies. I mean, not, uh, it, yeah, and they've changed over 20 years in a way. Okay. Um, but you know, they could be in, in, the, in poor parts of India, there could be a converted house or a converted you know, block of um, apartments or you know, room, single room tenements, we call them. Um, they could be a purpose-built school or a converted, I mean, I remember one of the converted schools I saw in, uh, in Hyderabad in those early days was a converted chicken farm, <laughs> you know, in a city chicken farm. But, you know, they, they were in converted factory buildings or warehouses, converted homes, sometimes purpose-built. In Africa, you're probably more likely to find them purpose-built buildings. Um, 
perhaps because you know it's quite a little bit less crowded in the countries yeah. I'm working in. Yeah. So why, given that all these places supposedly have government schools that are yeah. free, right? Why are parents paying to go to send their kids to a to a to a private school? Yeah, and that's a very important point. So all those countries I first researched, and which are the subject of the beautiful tree, my book, you kindly mentioned. I mean, so that was Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, India, and China. All those places had government schools. Latterly, when I'll be looking at Somalia, South Sudan, there weren't so many government schools. So that's a different issue. These ones, there were government schools, and, and there were really two reasons. And I think the two reasons are important. The one that everyone assumes, and is sort of obvious, is um, the, the public schools, the government schools, are not good enough. You know, a lot of research, not my research anymore, you know, a lot of research now is showing teachers turn up and teach about half the time they should in the government schools, you know, they have jobs for life, unionized jobs, they can never be removed. So they, you know, even if they start keen, they tend to drift away in the government schools, in the public schools. Um, in the private schools, if you don't teach, you, well, you get fired in the end, you know, quite quickly. Um, so, so, so this first reason would be the schools are not good enough provided by government and therefore the private schools are better. The second reason is that it's more, actually, it's more important the more I think about it. But even if the government schools were okay or not too bad, I still think there's an impetus in many parents, many parents, especially poor parents, to say, actually, we do want control. We do want some way of influencing what goes on the schools. We don't want to be, um, you know, we don't want to be sort of manipulated by a, a government or a state. We want to get what, what we want and to be have the school accountable to us. That's an important reason. And it's the reason that keeps slipping away because the first reason I gave the government schools aren't good enough is sort of obvious and everyone can latch onto it. The desire of ordinary people for autonomy, accountability, um, not to be supplicants, if you like, to a state system. That's a sort of less obvious one, but I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's... So often we found the central planners or the intellectual elites and so on, assuming that poor people don't care, assuming yeah. that poor people don't have that kind of uh, ambition for their kids. Right? And yeah. you, one of the things you said is the assumption was that these kids in the private schools weren't getting an education. They weren't going to the public schools and therefore they must be not going to school at all. Yeah. So that, that's, that's one thing. And that's a very important thing. So, and it shows really the value of the private sector. So when we first did, when I first did with my teams, the research in Lagos, Nigeria, for instance, um, it was widely assumed by government, the World Bank and other organizations that 30 to 40% of school aged kids were out of school, okay? And um, when I started doing my work, I, it seemed, no, they're not out of school. I, I, I'm going into the poor slums, the poorer areas. I can't see many kids out of school. They're all in the schools. Of course, then I realized most of these low cost private schools are unregistered. Therefore, they're off the government's radar. And therefore, yeah, people assume they're not going to school at all. In fact, they're in the low cost private schools. And do you know what the figure for out of school kids in Lagos is today? And it's not that different from what it was. It's about four or five percent. Oh, wow. Not 30, 40 percent. We still found the same thing in Juba in South Sudan. Government records thought 50 percent of kids were out of school. When you include the unregistered low-cost private schools, half, at least half of those were in those schools, and so on and so on. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, though, that um, well, going back to what you were saying, parents send their children to these low-cost private schools. The elites, if you like, you know, the elites in education are, you know, don't like this idea. You know, yep. they object. It. So they say these parents, they must be being hoodwinked. They're being hoodwinked by unscrupulous business men and women who are ripping off the poor, who are, you know, pretending there's something fake here about a private school. And these parents, this is what a government official told me in, in Lagos, Nigeria, these parents are ignoramuses. The poor parents are ignoramuses. They don't have a clue what they're doing. And you know what? All the research says she's wrong and the parents are right. They know what they're doing. Has there been there. research in terms of quality, comparing the quality of, of these private schools to, uh, to other schools? Yeah, so there's been quite a lot of research. Um, and although there are one or two outlier studies, 
um, the majority of the research shows that uh, the majority of the good research, and remember, remember, this is a complex factor. You've got to control for, amongst other things, family background, family education background, socioeconomic status, and selectivity bias. You know, the actual fact that these parents have chosen a particular school is that indica indicative of something about them. So you've got to control for all these things. But the studies typically show that the low cost private school children outperform those in the government schools. Um, by, by a lot, you know, half a standard deviation or more. Um, and typically the low cost private schools outperform at a fraction of the cost. Yeah. It, it's extraordinary. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, you, you, it's shocking the markets work and they provide a, a good service at a low price. It's yeah. shocking to the, to, the, to the authorities when these things happen. Yeah, no, you, you're right. And, and, and it's sort of, well, I actually, actually, when I first, as you said, I discovered, you know, that's sort of put that in square, scare quotes because obviously they were there. I had discovered them. I did discover them for the West, for, you know, people like ourselves because none of us knew about them before. Um, but, and then when you start looking at them, you start thinking, well, why are so many parents? I mean, when I started finding the schools, I thought they must all be charitable, you know, because such was my sort of, you know, as it were, my blinkers, you know, people must be charitably providing these schools. They're, you know, they're only charging a little bit of money and everyone's poor. So some great charity. But when you've seen, you know, 100, 200, 300, 500 of these schools, then 5,000, of course, you start realizing there can't be that much charity in the world. People are motivated by their own self-interest generally. And then you realize that actually these schools are there um, for, for another reason. But the question was, how good are they? You know, I mean, I didn't want, when I first found them, I didn't want to just assume the best. You know, I was, by this time, I was a, a, a you know, free marketeer, a libertarian, um, never a Randian, incidentally, but there you go. Um, uh, but, I, you know, I was a libertarian. And so, of course, I wanted to believe these schools were better. But, you know, I had to check this, you know, because it could be. Could be the parents were mistaken. Anyway, they're not. The schools are better and they're doing it at a low cost. And actually, one thing that your listeners, your, your, your viewers should know is the extent of this. So it's not some tiny phenomenon, okay? And, and the figures just continue to surprise. So in Lagos State, in Nigeria, over 70% of kids are in the private sector. Yeah. In Monrovia, in the slums of Monrovia in Liberia, the poor, you know, actually pretty much the poorest slums anywhere in the world, to be honest. Yeah. Again, that same sort of figure, 71% of the kids in the poorest slums are in these low-cost private schools. Go to Uganda, Kampala and the slums there, 80% of kids wow. in the slums are in private schools. In India, 70-80%. That's in the urban areas and in the rural areas, typically... 30%, something like that. So significant minority. So this is massive, you know. It, it, an estimate in India, there could be 450,000 low-cost private schools. Uh, census found uh, 12,000 low-cost private schools in Lagos State, Nigeria, now estimated probably to have increased to about 15,000. So this is not some little mom and pop thing going on somewhere, you know, one or two schools, how sweet. No, this is a mass movement a mass grassroots privatization. To what extent are governments um, in these countries opposing this, trying to regulate it, or maybe even trying to shut it down? Yeah, so, so this, is, this is the problem. And actually, when I first started discovering this and then writing about it in some tentative things, I, I, I then got scared, actually. I thought, actually, do I want governments to, to know about this? Because yeah. it's true, a lot of governments didn't like it, and once they started finding out about it, or they, they did start to close it down. And that's still happening today. And um, uh, yeah, and it, it's, 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 a, it's terrible, really. But I, I'm, I'm the patron of a federation of low-cost private schools in Nigeria called AFID. It's a wonderful Nigerian name, AFID, the Association of Formidable Education Development. And it, like many of uh, um, associations, was created in order to have a, you know, a strong voice against government. Government was trying to close down the schools. We created AFED in order to say, look, um, we are doing something valuable. We are doing something valuable 
We are offering a better education than your schools. We are the choice of poor parents. We're serving 70% of poor parents. And actually, have you thought, if you close us all down, how many billions you will have to spend on education? <laughs> you know, and you're already broke, you know. And so, you know, so actually then you get a better relationship and for a while at least they don't start to close you down. But you're right. India is perhaps, you know, surprisingly, um, perhaps one of the worst countries for this at the moment in that it created a new wonderful name act, the right to education. Who can be against the right to education? Well, the right to education means yep. the closure of thousands of low cost private schools because they're not good enough. They don't satisfy the extensive regulations that private schools got, have got to have under the right to education act. So these schools have got to close. No, you know, have they been yeah. successful or, or, or is, is some of the, these arguments and fights against the closures? Well, so, yeah, so, so schools are closed and, you know, I know there were you know, two or three thousand schools closed in the Punjab alone in North India. I was part of a federation there, the Punjab Private Schools Association, and, you know, we fought it. And my guess is, you know, between you and me, some of the schools have reopened. Now, sure, you know. sure. Uh, so there's a black market in a sense at school. <laughs> yeah, but but you know, in Indian in India is perhaps a difficult case at the moment because there are, you know, there are more closures than than in other countries now. Yeah, but other countries are not far behind, you know, and it's a, yeah, it's a difficult difficult situation. But you know, why are the government? Why don't the governments like this stuff? You know, I guess it threatens their existence in some sort of way doesn't it governments state governments are like the idea of education as state formation in a way well yes it's control i mean they, they very much like the idea that they get to they get a control on you know our kids <laughs> from a very young age yeah. uh, they get to control the curriculum they get to control the testing they yeah. get the yeah. file on everybody um, and they don't like to be shown up. They don't like to be shown that, hey, somebody else can do it better. Yeah. I mean, you know, how dare they, the poor, abandon the government schools? You, know, you can just hear someone saying, how dare they? You know, we've given them these schools. We've got bags of billions of dollars of aid and to, to create, you know, improve the state schools, the government schools, the public schools. And uh, if, they, if they abandon the school, what else might they abandon? <laughs> yeah. What else might they not need our help for? Like, yeah. the government very much in the, in the modern world gets its uh, its justification from the welfare programs and from giving yeah. stuff out. And when yeah. people say, "Oh, we don't need it," yeah, that, that. yeah. But one thing you said um, is is a sort of slightly disappointing thing about the low cost private schools. You mentioned government controls curriculum and assessment. That's still typically true in the countries. I'm describing either the government or some sort of, you know, once removed arm of the state. Um, and, and in a way, you know, it, it's, it's sort of slightly, yeah, dissatisfying. So the private sector is there, it's funded privately, it's provided privately, but it's heavily regulated. And typically, typically the, the state, you know, the, the state assessments are the only one, they're the only show in town, you know, so poor parents, of course, need those. And so, Poor parents will put pressure on the schools to provide what the state is saying is there. And so there's, so no competition, uh, uh, there's no competition over the curriculum. It's more on how it's delivered. Yeah, but I would like to see that competition. Sure, of course. I've just got a new book coming out with the Independent Institute, hopefully in November. And there's a couple of chapters on this, you know, the sort of it's praising the private schools for you know, breaking free on so many levels, but then saying, well, actually, they are still subject to this control. So could we have competition on curriculum assessment? Could we do this? And I, I point to a couple of sort of embryonic examples, which suggest, yes, pre, perhaps we could. And therefore, perhaps we could see an even more genuine market emerging. So I'm not doing down <laughs> the existing market. Sure. They're huge controls. And of course, if they didn't follow the state curriculum and assessment, they'd be closed, you know. So it's not that they're, you know, doing it uh, happily necessarily, um, but yeah. So I would like to see that sort of competition coming in as well. Very important. How are these parents paying for these schools? I mean, where do they? How do? How do they have enough money to pay for these private schools? Well, the fees are very low. I mean, that's that's so. 
I mentioned in my introductory remarks, I found the schools, they were charging one US dollar equivalent a month. That was 20 years ago. But now the schools in, say, you know, Ghana or Sierra Leone, they might be charging five to 10 US dollars per month. Um, in India, you know, you can get schools around that sort of price. And, and the, the important thing is, you know, that there are these poverty lines and they're slightly misleading the way they're described. You know, you probably, whatever that poverty line is now, $1.25, yep. you know. No, but that's actually, it's $1.25 per person and it's a purchasing power parity, which, you know, when you're in these other countries, obviously that means it's, it's, um, it's different from one dollar twenty-five, and so you know it's misleading to think of what uh, what what, uh, it, what those poverty lines say. But I, I've written a paper; it's in the Oxford Review of Education. Um, you can see it there, which says, okay, these private schools, how affordable are they? That's the question you're asking: so how affordable are they? And so what I've done is say, a family with the average number of kids on the poverty line, one of those poverty lines. Sure, um, sure. If they can afford to send all of their children to private schools for 10% or less of their total income, then I'd classify that as a low cost private school. So let's go that through that again. A poor family on the poverty line, they can send all of their children to private school for 10% of their total income. Then I called that a low cost private school. And in, in the slums of Liberia, that figure I gave you, about 60% of the private schools are of that kind. And then others are slightly more, you know, but still relatively affordable. Sure. So they are affordable. That's the key point. Um, sometimes there's researchers who, who, who look at the data and say, well, on average, you know, average private school fees and average expenditure, they're not affordable. Yeah. And the question is, well, how come there are so many of these in the slums? Exactly. And the yeah. answer is... Yeah, the answer is that um, the schools vary. It, yes. So if, if you're really poor, you can find a school that is affordable for you. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the key point. So they're affordable. They're better than the states, the government schools. They are attractive to parents. You know, they're fair, fair to girls. I and mean, that's something else that people question. Huh. Um, Interesting. Yeah. What, what is there not to like? Yeah. So what do you mean by fair to girls in the sense okay. that a lot of these cultures don't believe in educating girls? Yeah. So, so that's, that's the myth, isn't it? So that's the myth about, you know, about the developing world. Oh, they're just terrible to their girls. The girls don't get educated and it's all about the boys. And therefore, if there are low cost private schools, the myth is um, that therefore parents, poor parents will send their boys only to private schools. Well, that myth could have been true in you know, parts of India 20 years ago. Certainly not true today. It might be true in certain parts of Pakistan today, perhaps where Malala comes from in the Swat Valley. It might be true there. But typically, across the developing world, par poor parents will send both of their children if they can. If they can't afford, they will send the person who's most likely to benefit from which, which is often the girl. So the two things about being fair to girls, so a lot of studies now, again, from West Africa, like the studies there are very, very clear, show there are more girls in the low-cost private schools than boys, more girls, okay? Wow. Um, and then in parts of the world, which is still, you know, have, you know, old-fashioned attitudes towards boys and girls, like the Swat Valley in, in, in Pakistan, where Malala went to school. I'll tell you about Malala in a moment if you're interested. Yeah. Um, um, there, if you've got low cost private schools in your village or, or slum, you are, they're more likely to have, so girls will have more opportunity to go to school than if they're not there. So, you know, these schools are fair to mm. girls. So you were going to say something about Malala? Oh yeah. So, you know, everyone knows the story of Malala, don't they? You know, Malala, um, you, uh, she was the youngest person to, to win the Nobel Sure. Peace Prize. She got it in part because, she, you know, famously she was on her way to school and she was shot by the Taliban and so on. Mm -hmm. And the typical story that probably you've heard is that she was on her way to school where her father was the headmaster. And 
you know, you like most people, when you hear this story, think, oh, and so some public school there, and her father yeah, came. Yeah. Out. No, no, her <laughs> father was the entrepreneur who set up a low cost private school. She was on her way to a local private school. Her father was actually the was the vice president or the president of the Swat, Swat Valley Private Schools Association, one of these associations, like I've described, with 400 yeah. members in the Swat Valley. Malala is often used as a to stand for, um, you know, public education and the importance of it. She was, she went to low cost private schools. Her father was a beacon of low cost private schools, and. Uh, you know, she's she's used she's used incorrectly. We want to claim her for our side. Malala's low cost private schools personified. That's great. Mm. So is is um, are these schools for profit? I mean, is somebody is somebody uh, making a living out of this? Yeah. So so that's 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 a, that's a very good question, and and not amongst our circles, of course. Yep. But in some circles, for profit has got a, a bad name. Now I've got nothing wrong with for profit. You know, I think it provides us with most of what we require in life. Sure. But um, it, it's got, it, it, you know, it has hints of profiteering in this state. So a lot of, the majority of these schools are run as small businesses um, and they provide a living to the, to, the, to, the, to the man or woman who's running the school and of course to all the teachers and, sure. and so on. They're, they're therefore for profit, but um, you know, they make a small amount of profit, a small amount yep. A surplus um, to keep the families going. I, again, the figures, I, you know, the figures from different parts of the world in West Africa, I think about 60 uh, odd percent of the schools were for profit. And then the other 40 percent, so in the slums of Monrovia, Liberia, the other schools were run by community groups, um, churches, sure. um, and uh, non, non NGOs. Non -NGOs. Non -NGOs. And occasionally um, uh, a mosque or two in that. Okay. Yeah. Interestingly, you know, you can add to the for-profit schools the schools that were set up by what you might call independent churches, independent preachers. Because when you think of a church school, you typically think, oh, it, that's the, the church is subsidizing the school. But in many cases, for these independent schools, the church was subsidized by the school. The school, yeah. Okay. Um, that's quite common there, yeah. But actually, this is very interesting because the, the, the for-profit schools in the poor areas are typically, on average, cheaper than the non-profit schools. So the church schools, the NGO schools, they're typically more expensive than the for-profit schools, um, which perhaps should, yeah, is interesting. I mean, it's an interesting <laughs> research for why that's the case, but it's certainly something we found. So... I mean, one of the amazing things about you is that you're not just an academic who studies these things. You actually, you know, got into it and, and have become an entrepreneur when it comes to, to these schools. So tell us a little bit about, I mean, you've got a network of schools and a number of, number of networks in Africa that you founded and, and helped yeah. create. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. And you put it positively, but the danger, of course, is one becomes a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, and, you know, but and, and for whatever reason, yeah, for whatever reason, I um, yeah, I was an academic and, and, and was a, drawn into this area as an academic, first of all. But yeah. then I saw the opportunity, but I was I was never prompted, you know, and, th and this is this is a failing of mine. It's not I'm not saying this is a virtue, but I was never prompted by the you know, desire to make money. I was more prompted by the desire to philosophically prove that you could have a chain of low cost private schools run by a for profit company. And, you know, I've, I've co-founded a, a few of these chains in Ghana, um, India, um, Honduras and Central America. Um, and, you know, they, they've had mixed, mixed success. I'm not gonna claim too much, mm -hmm. um, but certainly, you know, they've been successful, very successful in the beginning. The Indian ones are very successful. Um, and um, certainly I've learned so much about it. You yeah, know. I can imagine. I mean, you can very easily be an academic, you know, sitting at, my, at your desk, typing stuff. You know, a lot of the stuff I write, wrote about being an entrepreneur was complete rubbish. <laughs> it, it bore no resemblance to, I mean, it's much more difficult being an entrepreneur. Yeah creating a business businesses fail businesses you know, lose money. Business. 
most businesses feel, yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, uh, uh, so, so running, you know, actually ha dipping my toe in the water and running some of these had made me think, made me realize just how much more, you know, just how much more effort was required and how much more admirable the people who set up these schools are than, you know, even when you write about it in academic terms, you know, it's really hard work and it's really difficult and you're likely not to succeed. You know? And um, what, what was it that differentiated your schools in, let's say, Ghana from the other private schools? Yeah, and actually, I just must mention the one in yeah. England as well. In a but um, yeah, I want to I want to get to the yeah. ability of all this to to kind of our yeah, yeah, no, where we live and we can bring it in there. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. So 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 the idea there was so setting up a chain of schools there in Ghana and India was the same and Honduras and uh, um, so so the idea is. Um, you've got your standalone schools that are making a little surplus. They can't afford to invest in curriculum, teacher training, technology as an individual school. So if you combine 30, 40, 50 okay. schools, you get the surplus multiplied by 30. So you can you know, do some R&D, research and development to improve what you're doing. So, so that, that was the idea that the schools would um, create you know, some technology solutions, um, some you know, other solutions. And, and one, of the, one of the ideas there in the schools was, was based on this. Okay, so the, the teachers in the low-cost private schools, remember they deliver better results than the teachers in the public schools. That's, so that's, that's the basis, okay? So then what I'm about to say, you know, I'm not criticizing those teachers, but are they as good as they could be? Are they as good as we'd like them to be? No. So one of the things we, we tried to do was to say, well, one of the, one area that teachers, it's, it's disaggregating the areas of teacher expertise. One ex area of expertise is creating lesson plans. Another area is creating good assessments. Another area is using assessments to in, you know, focus on teaching. Creating lesson plans is something we can take away from those teachers and we can develop a head office in, you know, uh, you know, with perhaps better paid curriculum developers who can create good content and then the teachers in the schools don't have to have that skill, which they haven't got. Mm -hmm. And they can use a scripted lesson plan or a semi-scripted lesson plan um, to, to go through in order to teach the kids better. Same with assessments. You know, if you leave the teachers in the class to develop their assessments, typically they won't be very good. You know, making good assessments is actually much harder than, than you think, particularly multiple choice questions, but every so um we do that for them, and therefore we improve the, the, uh, the, 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 what, what their interaction with the kids. And then we can do something with that data. We then take the data away centrally, and we say, ah, so this is interesting. We've got two very similar schools here, you know, school A and school B, very similar communities. And yet in school A, the mathematics at grade one is much better than the mathematics in school B. Why is that? Let's see what the teacher's doing better. Let's learn from each other and try and improve what's going on there. And it's those sort of little things that we did that, that you know, I think are valuable and do make for success. There's, there's a big company and, and um, now called Bridge International Academies who, who uh, yeah, they were inspired by um, the last chapter of The Beautiful Tree, which was actually a prize winning essay before The Beautiful Tree came out. And yeah, yeah. the entrepreneur behind it came to visit me and I was at Newcastle University then and I told him all about it. And, and they're very successful and very, you know, famous and notorious, really. Um, and they do some of this work within the scripted lessons and so on. Um, and, you know, that they, they attract a lot of probing for this, you know, because, you know, they're, they're too successful. But I think, um, well, I, actually, I was going to talk about them for a separate reason. Actually, very interesting. There was a study done in, in Nigeria where they're also working. Mm -hmm. And so they're a very successful chain of schools. And the study compared the chain of schools with the standalone schools apart from my federation and then the government schools. And it's no surprise, the private schools were all much better than the government schools. In English, the bridge schools were better than the standalone private schools. But in mathematics, there was no difference between them. Wow. Okay. In other words, so, so you know, I'm not, I'm not saying these chains of schools are a panacea. I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying there's certain things that could be done better, and the things I described sound as though they're going to improve standards. But actually, the low-cost private schools particularly gathered together in a sort of 
voluntary association, they could also be doing something very valuable as well. So I, I you know, I'm a bit of an agnostic about change, to be honest. Whereas two, five years ago, I would have perhaps been much more forthright saying, this is the way to go. You know, okay. Interesting. Evidence doesn't necessarily, you know, lead us there at the moment. Yeah. And we have to follow evidence. And maybe it goes back to the point you made earlier about a lack of competition around curriculum it's a, itself. That until we really get some competition around curriculum and being able to have more variety and more testing what works and what doesn't in terms of ideal curriculum, uh, we won't really have enough competition to really to really know. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think you're right there. And but remember that there's enough competition around that. Curriculum. So providers of that curriculum is enough competition and the private sector is doing better at delivering the government's curriculum than the government school. That's an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? You know, that's fascinating and, and worthy of, uh, of reflection. Um, but yeah, I would like to see different you know, co competing curricula, competing assessments. Yep. I think it could be done. I think there's a big project there to be done by someone who's um, you know got gets excited by this. You know, to see and and what 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 I'd like to do is to say, well, okay, at the moment you've got um, the government curriculum, and typically they have their national exams say what, the equivalent of grade ten, something sure. like that, sure. grade nine in Ghana, grade ten, grade. And um, before that, there's no, no other assessments. So a child can register in kindergarten, a parent can register a child in kindergarten, and then for 10, 12 years, they go through the curriculum and then they have the state assessment at the end. And if they do badly, is the parent gonna criticize the private school or the government school? No, the parent will pro probably blame their child. You know? mm -hmm. So what I would love to see is a series of proximate tests uh, I, I actually think, you know, I've, I've actually focused on something like the um, the belts you get in judo, something like that. You know, you go from <laughs> you go. Yeah. white belt to black belt. You know, you have, yeah. se I, I think in America you have seven or eight belts. I mean, it, it's, it's a, seven or eight is, is a sort of number that the private sector, when it's actually doing assessment mm -hmm. in judo, in martial arts, in piano, in piano, they also have eight grades. I would like to see those grades coming along. And then maybe the if, if I was a provider that's doing this, I'd have all these grades coming along and then the last one would have to be the same as the um, state curricula for now, the state exam. But then look what happens if a child drops out of school, which children do in Africa, um, at, you know, after three or four years, at the moment they leave with nothing. Mm -hmm. Under that sort of scheme, I'm saying they might leave with a, a yellow belt in mathematics, so, you know, green belt in English and a, Blue belt in entrepreneurship, or you know, and you could have a much, and that those could be in the, the things that employers want. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and you could get real human develop, capital development with a very simple innovation. What I described to you, it's not rocket science, um, but it could just transform assessment in these countries and start that sort of competition amongst assessors and curriculum developers. Mm -hmm. That's in this new book I've got. So uh, yeah, Good. I'm sort of. Uh, Getting excited by that now. Yeah, no, that's it's a, it's a great idea, and it's yeah. so. Why don't we see these, uh, you know, low cost private schools for poor kids in developed countries? Yeah. So this this has been a question. So when I've I've been I've been doing this work for twenty years now. You know, it's my yeah. life's work. Yeah. Um, and you know, in the early days, especially, but you know, giving talks in America or Britain or Europe or wherever, people would. You know, there would always be one person who asked that question, why is that not this thing happening in, in America or England or whatever? And I always thought it was a straightforward answer. I thought, you know, that probably was it three or four things. First of all, the public schools are not bad enough. You know, I mean, the public schools in Nigeria, yeah. Sierra Leone. They're bad, you know, but they're not bad enough, right? <laughs> Bad enough. That's the first thing I thought. The second thing I thought was um, maybe welfareism is stronger. You know, I mean, particularly in England, but in you know America too. In England, yeah. we're used to the state providing everything for us. Breeds passivity. Pacif yeah, passivity, but also also an entitlement. You know, yeah. why should we pay for this? This is the state should provide this. Interesting. You know? yeah. um, and anyway, those are two of the reasons. There, there, there are the range of others, um, but it. It always bothered me that those answers. And a few years back when I couldn't travel for various reasons and 
being just a one trick pony, this is the only thing I'm interested in, this low cost private schools or, or was then, um, I, uh, I was at Newcastle University then and I went to the, not poor areas, but just sort of parts of Newcastle and did a survey with myself and a couple of students and just saying to people, would they like to send their children to private school? And the answer was always, yeah, duh, of course. Yeah. Uh, why don't you? Obvious, they're too expensive. What could you afford then? And actually, we found quite a few parents who said they couldn't possibly afford private schools, could afford about £50 a week, £2,500 a year, roughly, like £2,700 a year. Um, and I developed a little business plan based on what work I've been doing in Africa and elsewhere. I thought, I reckon I can just about do a school for that amount, you know. Oh. Getting rid of all, all frills, you know. Um, yeah. Obviously, you can't have a beautiful, uh, private schools always beautiful buildings, expensive buildings. No, you have to have a rented building. Yeah. Having a rented building. Um, private schools have lots of facilities, you know. Gymnasiums um, and football pitches and... AstroTurf, yeah. planetariums, theatres. Um, and so, so actually, none. Um, and then private schools also have highly paid teachers. And say, so, well, actually, certainly my experience for the rest of the world, highly paid teachers can sometimes be been at it too long and might be a bit bored with what they're doing. You know? So cutting all those costs. Now, actually, because I'm not brave enough, I didn't actually undercut the state teachers' salaries, but I got teachers at the lowest level of state funding um, and got a rented church building as it happened. I mean, churches are wonderful and, and most religious organizations are the same. They have Sunday schools or the equivalent, so they have a beautiful church building and then they have three, four, five classrooms, which are empty during the week. So we got a good arrangement there where we rented these beautiful, beautiful church building. And this is in Durham, which is um, in the northeast of England, a beautiful cathedral city. And uh, so we started the first local spread school there again with, with um, uh, some, uh, a local partner up there, Chris Gray and Barry Craven. And, uh, and it was so difficult. <laughs> I, I mean, it was so difficult. You know, here was I thinking, okay, this is my country, England. You know, yeah. my government is not like governments elsewhere. It took us 485 days to get this school registered. You know? and, and in England, you know, if you don't register, you're, you're a penalty of prison uh, if, you, if you have a run on wow. wow. school. 485 days. And of course, because all, all e I was so eager at the beginning, I start, you know, we were advertising, we were talking, having parents' evenings, the school was going to open soon, and then we had to put it back once, twice, three times. You know, all the parents drifted away and said, I'm not going to trust this uh, loser professor <laughs> you know anyway it started and then all our parents meetings and our first days of the school the teacher unions picketed us handing out leaflets saying well basically well, whatever you can imagine anything bad that you can possibly think yeah. of we were going to do and anything good we couldn't possibly afford to do you know um anyway the school is up there it's it's been there a year now it's very small but it is break even is in sight. Okay. And the most important thing now, this is obviously we have to do what we have to do. And one of the things you have to do as a private school is get inspected by the government inspectors. Yeah. And they are rigorous. They are, and they're rigorous and not necessarily totally objective between you yeah. and me. But anyway, they inspected us for two solid days, no, three days, um, two inspectors. And they classified us as the second highest one you can be. And you can only really get that second highest when you're in your school. We are good. <laughs> That's the classification. We're good. And so having got that, we proved that our school is charging about £3,000 a year, which is three-fifths of the per capita funding in the local state public schools. We have proved you can run a good school, which is an accolade, believe me, you can run a good school by the government's inspectors, Ofsted they're called. You can run a good Ofsted school for three fifths of the price of a the state school and one quarter of the cost of the local private schools. Interesting. 
So maybe one of the reasons they don't, they're not a lot of these schools is the 485 days it takes to start it. I'm sure in the Nigerian slum, you don't, <laughs> you don't wait for 485 days to start your private school. No, <laughs> you're right. No, we were, it was slightly, you know, we were the first there. And so, and I'm not saying it would always take that long, but it would take at least six months, um, you know, um, and, and, you know, perhaps, yeah, so it takes time. Yeah, so it could be, I mean, what I'm, I'm hoping is I've, so we've got a model there. In a sense, we've proven the model in a very small scale and it's just one school, but ideally, you know, we'd want two, three, five, ten schools, create a little chain of schools to show what's possible. Um, and I'm hoping maybe others will come into the market. Again, I'm doing this for the philosophical reason, which is yeah. not the best reason to be a businessman, I'll, t- I'll tell you. I'm it's sure. Yes. <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm sort of doing it for, and so I'm putting money into it. Um, to, and let's see what happens. But it could be... Exciting. It could be exciting. And what I'm sort of... What, I'm what, age, about, what, what ages are the kids? This is, this is uh, what we call primary school, like elementary school that you, you'd call yeah. Yeah, um, at the moment. Um, yeah, it could be exciting and it could, you know, if you've got 10, 50, 100 of these schools, um, then you're going to start, you know, you're going to start exercising the government at least. And you might get you know, national newspapers saying, you know, how, how can these do it for two thirds of the cost of the state schools, you know, and why are parents paying twice, you know, so you can start thinking about tax credits and stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, but this, it's, you know, it, it's unproven at the moment, but I'm excited by that model. And let's let's see what happens. Yeah. Are you familiar with these Acton Academies in the United States? Yeah. So so I, I know um what's his name uh, John, J- Jeff Sandifer, isn't it? Jeff Sandifer. Yeah. yeah. I mean they're 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 a good model. They're expensive, mind you. They're expensive. They're not some um, low cost. I thought he was trying to bring the cost. The whole well, point he, was he, he he invited me there once yeah. and talking about it, and I was def- definitely you know trying to persuade him of that. I'm, I'm I'm glad that he has done that. Yeah. But I don't know that he has. Okay. But probably he has. Yeah. Yeah. And any familiar with with the story of Marva Collins in Chicago? Uh, so who's the story? Collins, Marva. No, Collins. no. Right, you should look into her. I'll, I'll send you yeah. a link. Uh, she was, uh, I mean, she she uh, passed away a few years ago, but she started a private school in the worst part of Chicago. Yeah, uh, basically in a in a house and uh, it did phenomenally well uh, by the yeah. kids. I mean, uh, had uh, unbelievable results and charged, and it was in, in a place where parents couldn't afford much, and she she charged, yeah, in, enough to keep herself going. But uh, yeah. but uh, the, the parents still still sent their kids there, and they did. They all went to college. I mean, it's one of these ridiculously yeah. successful. Uh, oh, that's terrific. Yeah, yeah. No, and I've been you know I've been hearing about similar schools since I've started this work and actually also getting phone calls every couple of weeks by someone saying, um, you know, I'd like to start a, a similar school in my part of the country. Good. A little pre, Pre-COVID-19, of course. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so let me ask you, you teach, at, uh, you teach at Buckingham University. Yes. Which is a little different than other universities in, in the UK. Can you tell us a little bit about Buckingham? Yeah, so the University of Buckingham is it's where I'm, I'm in Buckingham now. It's a small town, 50 miles from London, um, small town, 12, 15,000 people. Um, and the University of Buckingham was set up, well, the idea was there 50 years ago. And it came out of the Institute of Economic Affairs, the idea. Um, Arthur Selden, you remember, and yeah, yeah. Um, uh, others of that ilk. And it came because Government control of universities in England was getting stronger and stronger. Increasing proportions of funding was coming from government and with it increasing regulations. Because there's a, it's a, it's a curious fact in England and, you know, and people will listen or hear me say this, see me say this and think mm, that can't be right. But all universities in England are actually independent, private. It's just that they take government money and are therefore regulated by government and they forget that. But there are no public universities in England. Anyway, that's an aside. So as, 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 a, as a focus for dissatisfaction with state control of the existing universities, 50 years ago, 
people from the IEA, but others as well, from many notable universities, including Oxford, Cambridge, UCL, and so on, um, they decided to create a, an independent university which would not take government money and which would show that, you know, it'd be the demonstration you could have a, it was a non-profit, but a non-profit university not funded by government. And in those days, they thought that meant not being regulated by government, you know. And, you know, it's been going along. It's not been enormously successful, to be honest, but it's you know, survived 50 years or, you know. Um, uh, and actually, uh, another notable figure you will have heard of, um, the, in 1976, in February 1976, if I recall, we had our first matriculation of our first students, and the speaker was Margaret Thatcher. Oh, wow. um, she was then leader of the opposition. She'd just become the first female leader of the Conservative Party. A few years later, to become first British Prime Minister, female British Prime Minister. Um, and she was a great supporter of what we did. You know, and she said at this matriculation, she said something beautiful. She said, in the, I'm paraphrased, but independence is not something government gives you. You know, it's your birthright. It's there for you to claim, stand up for yourselves. You know, it was beautiful. Later, when she retired from her, her prime ministership, she um, she was our chancellor. That's like the figurehead of the yeah. university. Um, and, and she was that for, for, for quite a few years and a great supporter of us. Um, so, so we are this independent university. We're proud of it. Um, and I am, so I'm actually not teaching at them. I mean, I've got some PhD students, but I'm the pro vice chancellor, which is like the number two position in the yeah. university, you know, yeah. in a lot of management administration. Um, Obviously, COVID nineteen is it's going to hurt us like it hurts everyone. But I'm, you know, I'm. I think we will survive and we'll grow, continue to grow, and continue to demonstrate an alternative to the government universities. An actual fact, you know, what I mean to about in terms of low cost education. Perhaps you can start thinking about that in university terms as well. That's something for the future. Do you see? Do you see a movement towards more? towards privatizing education more is or is this just still kind of a fantasy we all have but it is is there growing support well so 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 distinguish two types of privatization so the one privatization is if you like the the top down so and um, you know in america that's typically people think of vouchers school vouchers tax credits and so you've got a government saying okay we've got all the the system of schools here we are now going to invoke school choice and give parents vouchers and, and so on. And they can choose private schools or public schools. Yeah. And um, to me, that, that's not the way forward, you know, and it's never worked either. It's never worked. I, I think the figure is something like, it's less than 1% of American children are in receipt of vouchers. It's yeah. one, I think it's less than, a, uh, I think it's something like, point, I haven't got the figure in my head. Certainly less than 1%, sure. a lot less than 1%. Um, and uh, it's the only place it's ever worked is Chile, where, you know, how did, how did it get in Chile and how did you overcome the teacher union as well? Pinochet had his particular methods of doing that, you know, so not, not to be copied. And it happened in Sweden as well, this voucher system, but that was perhaps a, a sort of a bit of a flu. So somewhat controlled by the government, right? The school. Yeah, somewhat controlled, but you know, it's, it's probably it's better than others. But, sure. you know, that's... To me, that still, that still maintains what I said earlier. You're still a supplicant to the state. You know, the state takes your money in taxes and then gives you some of it back in voucher. Why do that? What we see overseas is that word I used at the beginning, grassroots privatization, bottom-up privatization, privatization by the people for the people. You know, and that is absolutely not going out of fashion. That's becoming more and more in fashion across the developing world. Mm -hmm. And with these sort of little experiments, will it happen in Britain and America? Who knows? Um, it, it could happen. You've got to just have the entrepreneurs doing it. So that's what I'm in favor of. I'm, I'm you know, I don't get excited about voucher programs. You know, some dear friends are involved in those and I'm not excited by those. Um, I don't think they'll get very far. They failed in England they're under Margaret Thatcher, even under Margaret Thatcher, she wanted to bring something in. She couldn't get it through couldn't Parliament. Get it. Yeah. She couldn't get it past the teacher unions or the bureaucrats in the Department for Education. Um, and I don't think anyone can. This system from the grassroots up has a chance of success. I suppose my work is mostly overseas where it's brilliant, brilliantly successful. Um, will it happen here? Well, let's see.
Mm. Well, this has been uh, this has been a real treat. Thank you. Uh, this has yeah. been a lot of fun. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, thank uh, thank all of you for for tuning in today. I, I appreciate that. And uh, don't forget to share this and to like it and do all the social media things you need to do in order to get this out there. Yeah. And uh, I look forward. Hopefully, one of my trips to the UK once this virus goes away and everything. Well, you know, we I can come visit you in uh, in Buckingham. Come and give it to me. That would be to. wonderful. I'd yeah, love yeah. To, I'd love to do that. Good. Well, Good thanks, James. Yeah. Have a great rest of your weekend. Have uh, all the listeners out there have a great rest of your weekend, and I'll be back probably tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thank Bye. you so much for inviting me. Bye-bye.